Dr Robert Arnold, who's going to talk about dealing with difficult conversations, which we've already heard uh, is a major issue for so many people. Robert is Professor of General Internal Medicine in the Department of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. He's also the Director of the Institute for Doctor-Patient Communication and the Medical Director of Palliative and Supportive Institute at the University of Pittsburgh. He's a working palliative care physician and his research interests include uh, educational interventions to improve communication and also the application of ethics to clinical practice. So please welcome Dr. Robert Arnold. So I'm the one with the funny accent. Um, I know, what can you do? Ooh. This is what happens when you have it too close to your mouth. It, but I won't piss her off because I'm part of, a, <laughs> part of a panel up there tomorrow and I'm in big trouble if I do anything that makes her mad. Okay, so um, how many of you are nurses? Can we just do like a show of hands? So the middle group doesn't have any nurses. How many of you are social workers? Okay, how many of you are physicians? How many of you are lawyers? <laughs> What? There's nothing wrong with being, my brother's a lawyer. How many of you are like pastoral care, spiritual, religious? Okay. Um, how many of you are administrators? That would be sort of like lawyers, but. Okay, don't be sad, raise your hand. It's, it's okay, don't be like embarrassed. Uh, anyone I left out? Can you say it like one of you? Because. Volunteers, okay. How many of you are volunteers? Good. That just is a nice way of saying you don't get paid. Yeah? A project worker? I don't know what that is. Okay. Wow. Huh? I'm sorry? Carers. Carers, okay. Informal carers, also not getting paid, yes. Okay, liaisons for hospitals. I thought, in fact, the introduction about Aboriginal care workers was quite amazing. We would never in America have Native uh, Americans uh, come and do that. So I, I found that quite fascinating. So I'm going to talk a little bit about difficult conversations. I want to try to figure out what a difficult conversation regarding advanced care planning or end of life is, try to figure out what makes them difficult, and then try to give you three skills which may help you when you have a difficult conversation. So what about difficult conversations? What is a difficult conversation for you? So if we say, you know, what are the conversations that make you want to sort of have tea? Because we don't have tea in America either. What are difficult conversations? What are conversations with patients or families that make you a little, hope your beeper goes off or that you get to leave? No, there it can be loud. Just say it loud, I'll repeat it. When you're not sure? When you're not sure? Okay. Like why? Things that make them uncomfortable. Like why? Talking about dying. Are there questions in particular that you really hated if a patient or a family asks? What are they? How long? Okay, what else? Euthanasia, will you help him die earlier? Okay, what else? I'm sorry? Can you say it louder, please? Okay. Where's the why me? Why me? Why is this happening to me? That may be difficult. What else? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? When they criticize another member of your team? Yeah, that, I was doing fine until that nurse did. Well, that's what they say to me, because I'm a doctor. <laughs> to you, they talk about those doctors, right? Okay. How do we tell the children? How do we tell the children? Now, let's be clear. What makes them difficult? First is they make you feel hopeless or guilty. Why me? Isn't there more you can do? You feel, in fact, some of the hopelessness that they have. 
Second, there's often an emotion behind them, so they get angry at you, or they get angry at someone else. The, that doctor, if that doctor would have told me about that I had to get screening, none of this would have happened. And finally, it's often that there's no answers. Why me? I mean, they really don't want to hear about oncogenes, right? Isn't there something else? Isn't really about all the sort of scientific advances. How long? I mean, they really don't want you to say, well, seven hours, 13 minutes, <laughs> and, uh, now only 10 seconds. So part of what makes difficult conversations difficult is that you're really not sure what they're asking, and you're not sure how to give them an answer that will make them feel both heard and understood. Are there other things that I've left out that make you say, ooh, yeah, this is, this is the worst? Can I just say, I don't think it's, this is the worst, but I think for the person who's doing the interview, sometimes in the transaction, the unspoken transaction you're trying to do <coughs> the person the family or the expertise, is that you have got to give an expectation or comfort that you will see forward for the advanced care plan you know, as a clinician, how many steps there are that may thwart the actual giving of this peaceful death you want to give. You know what I mean? There's the doctor's attitude, there's the staff's attitude. So I think there's kind of, there's kind of a hesitation with some people in, in the promise of the president. So you want to make it all okay. Yes. And understand that it's not yours to make okay. And that leads to feeling sort of hopeless and sort of not feeling like you have much power. And in fact, feeling like a lot of people feel when they're on the patient's end, trying to sort of be the patient in an environment in which they don't know. I think that's a really good thing that makes it hard. I guess I do want to sort of say that my sense of palliative care and a good death is a little bit different than a lot of the people here. I think you have good deaths in the ICU. I think a good death is whatever the death that gives the patient or the family meaning. And I get that we need to be careful that our conception of what counts as good isn't necessarily other people's conception. I mean, I have people that their entire life has been chaotic. The way they're going to die, boys and girls, is going to be exactly the way they live. <laughs> Everyone's going to be running around. I shouldn't expect they're going to hum kumbaya, which is then. <laughs> Oh, it's you guys hum that too. Okay. Or anyway. So what I want to do is tell you that when you get those conversations, that communication makes a difference. There's a fair amount of data that it improves patients' adjustment to illness. There's, you know, both uh, Dr. Kassain and Phyllis Buto, who's in Sydney, has done a fair amount of research about trying to sort of work with families and with patients, and then it improves their uh, adjustment to illness, the psychiatric outcomes that they have after illnesses, that it lessens pain and other physical symptoms. There's data that how you communicate to people increases adherence and satisfaction, and it has decreased use of ineffectual treatments. And if you don't do it well, there's conflict, there's less adherence. I'd also argue that good communication skills benefits you because these conversations, the conversations that you find difficult are the ones that you go home and want to you know, complain to your spouse about. They're the ones that are correlated in the ICU literature with burnout. And so being able to do this, do this, is going to help you. So I'm going to talk about three principles that may help you in difficult conversations. The first is called Tell Me More, which is really trying to explore what the world of the patient and the family is like. It's a nicer way to, than trying to do what we often do, which is we play 20 questions with patients or families, and they're like, why are you asking all those questions? The next is checking expectations and then understanding, or what we call ask, tell, ask. And the final is not trying to solve, but empathizing. And the acronym there is going to be NURSE. So we're going to walk through each of these. I'm going to explain them, and then I'm going to show you a video, because my closest colleagues are um, 
three other Americans, Tony Bach, James Tolsky, and Walter Bales, who are uh, in different places in uh, America. And we have these videos, which will hopefully show you a little bit of what these skills might look like. Now, one of the things that people will do is they'll say, can't you help me die? Which is, in fact, one of those questions that makes you want to say, let me get to talk to my doctor and I'll get back to you. Right? Or, uh, that's a really good question, but it's against the law. <laughs> or, well, it's not against the law. Or to say, and, uh, how's your breathing? <laughs> right? What I want you to do in those situations is, in fact, take a deep breath and say, that's a really important question. Tell me more about what you're thinking. So the patient says, how long do I have to live? And my question to you is, what are they asking? When a patient says, how long do I have to live, what do you think they're asking? Do, do I have time to do anything really important? So do I have time to do anything important? What else could they be asking? The trajectory of the pain? Or so am I going to have pain as I die? What else could they be asking? Am I really going to die? Am I really going to die? Those other doctors, they were kidding, right? Yeah, what else could they be asking? They may want you to say, oh, it's going to be longer than you think. They may want to know what their median survival is, right? The engineers among you. They, they may want to know about choices. They may want to know, are they going to live to get out of the hospital? They may want to know that their 50th wedding anniversary is this Friday. Are they going to make it? And in fact, what I would tell you is you have no idea. And so the appropriate answer is, that's a really good question. Tell me more about what you're thinking about. That is. All it allows you to do is get a sense of what they're thinking about in a pretty open-ended, non-interrogative way. And so I'm going to show you an example from an oncology practice of what it looks like. So I'm back to work. I've um, got a couple of new clients couple of projects I'm busy working on. And my only complaint is, I, and I, I hesitate to even mention this, but I, I have this little bit of a lower back thing. So tell me more about this back thing. Well, I don't, it's something that comes off and on, and I'm sure it's nothing serious. So rather than say, oh, how long you had it for? Where exactly is it? Does it get better? Or work? All you have to say is, huh. Tell me more about that. And then shut up and let them tell the story. <laughs> I know, it's hard. Let them tell the story of what they're concerned about. So the first thing when you get in a conversation where you're feeling stuck is to stop talking and to say, tell me more. The second thing is that we often give information. In fact, we do a lot of audio taping of doctors and transcribe it, and doctors are little um, soliloquy makers. So if you look at what oncologists do, they talk for about five minutes or about 15 pages about the risk, benefits, and alternatives of each of the medicine. And it's great if you're listening to, you know, if you have insomnia, because it's way more information than anyone needs. And the problem is it's not based, well, why do we, what's our goal when we talk? I want you to learn something. So my goal isn't my talking, my goal is making sure that you get information. And if that's my goal, what I need to do is first figure out what you already know, Second, give you information in America in a fifth grade reading level, because that's the level you understand it. And third, and most importantly, and this is what doctors don't do, is make sure that I understand what you understand. And so the way to often do that, that I do, is I say, when you go home, who are you going to talk to about what we talked about? Can you help me out? Because sometimes I, you know, 
uh, I get off track. Can you tell me what you're going to tell your, your husband about what we said? Or tell me who you're going to call after I leave, just to make sure we're on the same page. Tell me what you took away from this meeting. So I close the loop, because the goal of my talking is education. And if I don't do ask, and then tell, and then ask again, I won't know what they really heard. And what the psychologists tell us is we assume they heard way more than they really did. We assume that people hear everything that we say. I mean, you all have children. Don't they do hear everything that you say to them? <laughs> and in fact, we know from the literature that people only hear about 10 to 15% of what we say. So this is an example of Ask Tell Ask. I'm not really sure why I'm here. Hmm. So has anybody talked to you at all about um, your PSA test and what that might mean? Yeah. No, not really. No. OK. Is it OK if we talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of the reasons I want to see you back is because your PSA test, if you remember, that's the blood test we do to check how your prostate cancer is uh, yeah. doing. Yeah. Since the last visit, it's gone up a little bit. You know, I had those, those uh, radioactive seeds uh, implanted uh, to stop all that. Right, and I can see how you'd, how you'd think it should all be gone now. So, Greg, we've just been talking about a whole bunch of stuff, and um, sometimes I don't explain things really well. So it would be helpful to me if you could tell me in your own words uh, what we've just been talking about so I can be sure that you understand. Well, my, my PSA apparently is up. Right. Uh, and you're afraid uh, <clears throat> that my cancer is back. So you're, uh, you want me to do some more tests, bone scan, mm -hmm. probably another PSA. <clears throat> is that about right? That was the final ask. So again, you ask. You ask permission, you tell, and then you check in again and ask again. This is the one that, in fact, is the hardest for healthcare providers. And I know that healthcare providers, the nurses, will all say, oh, we do this, it's the doctors who don't do it, and yet the data suggests that nurses who like to fix problems are no better at it than doctors, so I know you can feel morally superior for many other reasons. <laughs> This, this probably isn't one of those reasons. Um, how many of you have had bad news in the last six months? Bad news. Any news that was unexpected, that wasn't good. You know, your kid ruined your car, you burned a meal, something. Doesn't have to be big. First reaction to bad news? Crap. OK. Upsetness. What else? Disbelief. Disbelief. What else? Anger. Anger? It's, not that bad. it's not that bad. It's trying to calm yourself down. Shock. Shock. Denial. Denial. I want to point out all those things are, in fact, emotions. And when you have emotions, what happens is it turns off your brain. Now, again, let me give you an example. How many of you have a significant other? How many of you have ever had a significant other? <laughs> How many of you in the last year have had a disagreement or argument with your significant other? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> How many of you during that argument said something which you knew would piss your significant other <laughs> off, and you said it anyway? <laughs> now, the reason you did that is because when you have an argument, you get an emotional response that blocks your ability to think. So if you do functional MRIs, what you see is when people's amygdala light up, the rest of their brain goes pretty silent. And so emotions turn off cognition. And almost all these conversations and questions that you gave to me were all 
at their heart about loss and sadness and disbelief and grief. They were about emotions. And so what I want you to do is when you get an emotional reaction, I want you, rather than to try to fix it, which is what you do, what you, your significant other does to you, right? You've had a really bad day. You come home and start bitching to your significant other. And when they say, oh, I'm sure it's not that bad, or I'm sure tomorrow will be better, or have you thought of maybe trying this? <laughs> you like throw something at them, right? Because what you want them to do is just acknowledge the emotion. And the acronym we came up with is called NURSE. You just want them to name it, to show that you understand or are trying to understand what they're going through, to respect the struggles they're having, to support, show that you'll be there to, to, to help them out, and if you're not sure what they're saying, to explore it. So let's talk about name. It sounds like you're worried that cancer might be recurring. It sounds like it's been frustrating. I can see how sad you are. That's all you need to do. This is really a tough spot. Oh my goodness, this sucks. This isn't what you wanted to have happen. Those are all just naming responses. And yet, I can tell you that two-thirds of the time, healthcare providers don't do this. They change the subject. I'm really scared about what the, the, what the scan's going to show. How is your breathing? <laughs> I'm really scared about what the scan will show. I'm sure it'll be OK. This is a, an example of names. So I'm just not sure if this is something I'm supposed to worry about. Well, you know, that test result was kind of uncertain, and that's precisely the reason we need to do the follow-up test. OK. Look, if it's OK with you, I'd like to just proceed as though there's nothing wrong. Sure, that'd be fine. OK. It's just naming it, showing that you understand it. It must be hard to be in pain like this. I can't imagine what it's like to experience such severe nausea. I, I understand why you're frustrated. We would really hope his kidneys would start working again. What I would argue is what's even better is I can't imagine how frustrating this might be. Because in fact, I don't understand exactly why you're frustrated. We really hope his kidneys would start working. So what I'm going to ask that we do is we're going to play a game. Because Americans, you know. I'm going to give you a phrase, and I want an empathic response. And we're going to do, we're going to start, do, there are how many? Four sections. So I want one person from each section, I don't care who, to do it. So why is this happening to me? I did all the treatments, and it's still getting worse. Perfect. So there's got to be something more that you can do for my dad. I mean, they, they, there's like all these studies that they're doing and stuff. There's got to be some treatment you can give him. Silence is good, but I'm asking for a verbal, a verbal empathic response. It's really what I'm asking for now. Tell me more about what you mean. Well, I just want there to be something. You know, there's got to be something. I mean, they're doing all these studies and stuff. There's got to be something you can do. Um, sounds like you're really worried about your dad. Yeah. OK. Um, why is God letting this happen to me? I mean, I go to church, I've lived a good life, and I retire, and then I get this happening? Sounds really pissed off with God. So I'm going to think, that's a great response. Here's a suggestion. <laughs> when you are naming an emotion, if you have a choice between naming it as you're really furious or it sounds like you're really, you can't understand, that is undernaming the emotion, it's usually better if you undername the emotion 
rather than you overname the emotion. So if you're going to name the emotion, undername it. Okay. Um, and t he was doing fine yesterday until that nurse put the catheter in and got so sick. So I want to tell you that if there's one thing that in difficult conversations you need to do is you need to stop thinking of them as cognitive conversations and start thinking of them as really emotional conversations. And I again would reflect back to your lives. I mean, do you really care whether the toilet seat is up or down? Yeah. Oh, you do? And what you really care about is being heard? And it's the third time you've asked, and you feel unheard. And often what underlies conversations about whether you get a raise or not is whether you're respected and valued in your job. And so that while there can be cognitive content of these conversations, I'm going to argue that there's often an emotional content of these conversations. And that as healthcare providers, because we're little um, cognitive ATM machines, we attend to the cognitive part of the conversation and want to fix it, and we don't respond to the emotional part of the conversation. There are some other skills which I view as gravy. Respect. I'm impressed that you've been able to live so much of your life with your pain. I'm impressed with how well you've cared for your mother during this hard illness. Support. My team and I will be here to help you with your pain. We'll be with you during the illness no matter what happens. I'll continue to work with you to figure out what's best for you and what we should do next. Explore. Tell me more about how it's affecting you. I sense how upset you are about hearing the results of the CAT scan. Help, help me better understand what's going on. Is there anything else that's making you feel anxious? Tell me a little bit more about what you're thinking is often a way to begin to get people to talk about what's going on and what their emotions are. So I'm going to I'm going to argue that in difficult conversations, in conversations where it feels like you've given bad news and they haven't heard it, or it feels like the family's sort of disagreeing, or it feels like you're saying the same thing and you're going around in a big circle, you should Try to think about, have I used three skills? Tell me more so that they can tell you what the story is and what the disagreement's about. Asking before telling and then checking in to make sure that they really heard what you said and attending to emotions. What I want to do now is that rather than have me babble on more, it would seem to me that it would be more helpful for you to talk about some of your difficult conversations and for us to brainstorm about other ways that we might handle them. Would you like to give him a round of applause?